The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of Mark's Gospel. We'll be begin there in verse 23, but we'll be reading through chapter 3, verse 6 this morning. Somebody's car's getting uh, broken into. Wait. No, somebody's leaving and hit the wrong button. So we'll figure out who that was later. But Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 23, reading on through chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save life, or to kill. But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we read Holy Scripture, we pray, Lord, for a word from you through these words, a word that calls us evermore into the work of your kingdom, into the security of your grace, and into the fullness of your love. So speak to us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, have you ever played a board game or maybe a card game with one of those people? Some of you are thinking, what kind of people? You know the kind of people. Let's say you're playing, I don't know, Scrabble, your turn, and you play the word Xerox, which, let's be honest, ought to just end the game, right? I mean, it's got not one X, but two. Some of you go, no, it's got a Z. No, two X's. X-E-R-O-X. Now, when you play this word, let's say you're playing with four friends or three other friends. Two of them are amazed, astonished, really, at your mastery of the English alphabet. But then there's that other friend. That other friend, usually the one who's just lost the lead to you, who coughs, <coughs> excuse me, I hate to burst your bubble, but Xerox is a proper noun. And the official rules of Scrabble say you cannot play a proper noun. And so they reach across the board with a smirk on their face, they pick up the X, they pick up the E, they pick up the O, they pick up the, or the E-R-O-X. <laughs> Obviously, I do not play, anyway. And as they do this, they hand them back to you and go, sorry, and give them back. We all have friends like that, don't we? If you don't think you do, guess what? You're that friend. (laughs) You're the one who, when you're playing a game, pulls out the phone and Googles. I don't think you can do that. When you're playing Uno and someone lays a draw for it, you can't lay a draw for it after a reverse. They say something like that. I suppose that there is a place for those strict rule followers, for those who like to quote the rule book, for those who have it handy, who have an app for it, who have Google ready at the drop of a hat. I suppose there's a place for those, especially in times of confusion, maybe when the outcome is a bit too close, when a questionable card is played, and when, as is most often the case, the lead changes to someone else. 
I suppose there's a place for rules, parameters that are set in order to make sure things are fair, that the playing field is level. My experience, however, has been that once someone starts constantly quoting the rules, once someone starts calling out every infringement of proper protocol and procedure, it's just not fun anymore. All the joy leaves. And you're just left wondering when it's all going to be over. When are we going to be done with this game so we can get back to having fun? Doing the thing that games were meant to do in the first place. Having fun and enjoying time with your friends. After all, what real joy is there in pointing out everyone else's mistakes? At first reading, I suppose some might think that's what these Pharisees in this chapter, in these two stories, are up to, citing the rule book, pointing out Jesus and his disciples' mistakes, especially when someone else takes the lead, and when that someone else is a rabble-rousing rabbi from Nazareth named Jesus. We've heard it at least a hundred times, those of us who've hung around church long enough, usually go something like this. Well, you know, the Pharisees loved the law, but Jesus was all about grace. We sort of misinterpret Paul a little bit there. And that's partially true, I guess. The Pharisees were concerned about the law, which for them included the actual Hebrew scriptures and the oral traditions that surrounded them. That's why they confront Jesus in verse 24. Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, lest there be any confusion, the unlawful thing they do is not stealing grain from somebody else's field as they pass through. In fact, they were probably just gleaning the edges, and that's actually encouraged in the Scripture. No, the law the Pharisees accuse Jesus and his disciples of breaking is the fourth commandment, unless you're Lutheran or Catholic. It's the third one, but that's a whole other ball of wax. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, by this time, by the time of Jesus with these Pharisees, that commandment had been explained and expanded to include a rather exhaustive list of activities, actions, movements, and events that were all prohibited from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday on the Sabbath because those things might be understood as work. And therefore, if one were to participate in these actions, you would be in direct violation of breaking that commandment. You would no longer be remembering the Sabbath, nor would you be keeping it holy. Two things expressly forbidden on the Sabbath were traveling and gleaning grain. So the Pharisees are accusing Jesus and his disciples of not honoring the Sabbath, of breaking the fourth commandment. Now, of course, Jesus is quick to point out to them that sometimes it's necessary to bend the rules a little bit, especially in the service of God. He cites a story from 1 Samuel chapter 21, though though Jesus or Mark or somebody gets the name wrong. It's Ahimelech, not Abiathar, who's the high priest, but you all knew that, right? It's a story about how David is fleeing from Saul. Saul seeks to kill David. And so David, as he is running away, runs into the tabernacle. He and his men are famished, and he goes and says, there's bread here, here in the tabernacle for the presence of God. Uh, Let's eat this. And he takes the bread, and it says he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Now, this story isn't explicitly about breaking the Sabbath, but it's an example of how even the most sacrosanct laws must sometimes be broken in light of the greater purpose, in light of a greater good. Really, though, the point Jesus is trying to make here is that laws were meant for human beings, meant to guide us, direct us, keep us in line with God's greater purpose. They are not meant to be weaponized, used as a method of measuring ourselves over against the failures of others. That's why Jesus says the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other words, it's almost like Jesus was saying, stop thinking, stop asking, stop, stop nitpicking about the Sabbath, the law in general. Don't stop, stop thinking that it precedes the very existence of humankind. Stop thinking that the law is, is superseding even your neighbors or yourselves or anyone else. It doesn't. 
And if Jesus is Lord even of those laws you cling to in order to find some measure of righteousness, Jesus is Lord even of those. Now, this isn't the first time, nor is it the last time, that Jesus is accused of breaking the Sabbath. That's why we read this part of chapter 3. It picks up with this scene, maybe on the same Sabbath, maybe a different one. Jesus enters the synagogue, and a man approaches him, a man with a withered hand. Now, Mark tells us that they, the Pharisees, watched Jesus to see whether he would cure this man on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. You see, curing people, healing people on the Sabbath wasn't expressly prohibited by the law if it were an emergency. But this man, this man didn't just accidentally crush his hand sitting around on the Sabbath. Now, I know this is Jesus. I know these are the Pharisees. And I know that the point Mark is trying to take, make in this point of the narrative is taking us to Christ's crucifixion. But I cannot help but recognize the timeless tendency of so many self-proclaimed righteous folks in these verses from Mark. They watched him so they might accuse him. You know, I have found it to be true that whenever you go looking for something, guess what? You'll find it. Whether you're looking for something to complain about at work, at school, or church, whether you're looking for that fault in your friend so you can justify your own jealousy, or whether you're looking for someone to let you down, you'll always find what you're looking for. And these folks found what they were looking for with Jesus. Something to pin on him. Healing on the Sabbath. Unnecessary healing on the Sabbath. Because it might sound strange that healing is forbidden. But keep in mind, again, this isn't a particular emergency. This man had likely suffered with this withered hand for some time. And keep in mind that the Sabbath, in case you don't know, is just sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Jesus has been traveling. Jesus has been teaching in the synagogue. Why can't he just wait a little while? Wait for the sun to go down and heal the man's hand. But he didn't. Jesus healed him, though, perhaps in a passive sort of way, because Jesus actually doesn't touch him. In fact, Jesus doesn't even say anything but hold out your hand. But he does it right there, on the spot, on the Sabbath. Jesus knew what they were looking for, and he gave it to them. But why? Why not stay within the law and just wait for the sun to go down. If this is a, a miracle story, why not just wait for the right time? Do the miracle then. The Pharisees have nothing but to say, well, he healed a man. Did he do it on the Sabbath? No, he waited till dark. No. Why, why purposely provoke the anger of the Pharisees? I mean, sure, some might point to that this is all part of the plan, part of setting the whole wheels in motion. After all, Mark is really, most scholars say, just this long introduction to Jesus' passion narrative. And Mark says that the Pharisees went right out afterwards and conspired with the Herodians against him. How to destroy him? But if Jesus had just followed the rules remembered his Bible verses, recited the Ten Commandments, if he had just waited a little while longer to when the time was right, he still would have been able to miraculously restore this man's hand, and he would have done it within the limits of the law, inside the rules. But he doesn't. In fact, it's almost like Jesus is trying to show them something, trying to teach us something bigger something deeper with his actions in that synagogue on that Sabbath. And it's almost like there's some deeper lesson in the silence of the Pharisees after Jesus asks, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? Could it be that Jesus is trying to teach them, trying to teach us that there is something greater Something far beyond a righteousness found in following all the rules. I think, it's too, I think it's too simple. I think it's too simple an answer to say that Jesus is just throwing out all the old ways. And that's the Old Testament, and we live in the New Testament. We live under a new covenant. That that's the old ways, and Jesus is all about unconditional grace. I think it's too simple, and I think it's wrong. 
Not because I think that Jesus didn't preach, teach, and show us what unconditional grace looks like, but because I don't think that's what those laws were. I don't think they were conditions. No, I think like so many of the good gifts we receive from God, they are initially acts of mercy and love. Ways to show God's people a path to living as God's people in in relation to one another and to the rest of the world. But as we so often do, when God gives us a good gift, we twist it. We morph it into something that it was never meant to be. The commandment concerning the Sabbath was a commandment meant to call the hearts and minds of God's people back to their bondage in Egypt. To remember that they had once been foreigners, that they had once been slaves. They were once outsiders forced into a system of oppression and dehumanizing existence. It was a commandment meant to remind God's people that everyone created in God's image deserved to be recognized as such, and in doing so, rest from their labor at least one day a week. But these Pharisees and so many others had warped the commandment into some sort of sin accounting measure, a way of heaping guilt on those who have to travel and glean grain to eat on the Sabbath, a way of looking down their noses at folks who have to punch the clock on Sunday morning or cut their grass after church or eat out at lunch when the service is over. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy was never about do's and don'ts for Saturdays or Sundays. It was about God and God's love and grace for all people. You see, I'm growing more and more convinced that what Jesus was doing, what Jesus is still doing, is calling us to see that there is so much more to God than what we've come up with in our religions. I'm becoming more and more convinced that what Jesus was up to was showing us that our feeble attempts at keeping score are dumb. Little more than thinly disguised fear. Because that's really what's at the heart of all legalistic attempts at controlling God and God's people. It's fear. Misinterpretations of Sabbath, of the law, the Bible, doctrines, traditions, all these things are simply tethers that keep us linked to our own fear. Fear that, well, forgiveness isn't enough. Fear that grace isn't enough. Fear that compassion isn't enough. That love isn't enough. But Jesus, Jesus is calling us, showing us that forgiveness is enough. That grace is enough. That compassion for one another is enough. That love is enough. That we don't have to keep score. Love is enough. And it's enough to save us, all of us. It's enough to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It's enough to warrant an apparent breaking of the Sabbath to heal a man's withered hand because the inbreaking of God's kingdom of love won't wait for the sun to set. It can't wait until the things are right and proper on our timetable. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath And the Lord of the Sabbath sets the pace. And his pace is one of relentless, limitless, unconditional love. And you can't hold that back on the Sabbath. You can't hold that back from anyone. No matter who they are, what they are, what they do, or what they don't do. The Lord of the Sabbath isn't waiting on the time to be right. The conditions to be right. And I hope you hear me what I'm about to say. God isn't waiting for us to be right. For our hearts to be right. He loves us anyway. Jesus loves us, each and every one of us. Even if it looks like it goes against the law. Even if it goes against tradition. Even if it goes against our self-satisfying interpretations of scripture. Jesus loves us anyway. Whether we keep to all the rules. Or whether we break every single one of them. Jesus loves us anyway. The Lord of the Sabbath loves us anyway. And that love is always more than enough. You pray with me.
Jesus Christ, Lord of the Sabbath, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. Help us, Lord, to see that whatever attempts we may have uh, to follow all the rules, however many times we've broken them, that you still love us. And Lord, that your unconditional love is not just a free ticket to ride, but it is liberation from our fears. It's freedom from whatever it is that keeps us from loving you and our neighbor fully. It's freedom, Lord, from trying to keep account of the wrongs of ourselves and the wrongs of others. God, help us to take hold of that freedom and that love today to experience it in a full way. And God, as we go out from this place to show just how real it is to everyone who crosses our path. Move in our presence, Holy Spirit, as we listen for a word, for a calling from you. And give us the courage to respond. In your holy name we pray. Amen.